and I, and I, I, I know you want to talk about other things. I want to talk about the Gulf. I have breaking news tonight that is very important for people to hear. Hit us with your best shot. And I would like to bring Robin on in a few minutes because she was down there, you know, risking her life, her health, to do things for people on the ground. And because she was there, I want her to report firsthand what she saw and what she did not see and who she interacted with because that's an important part of the rest of the story. Here's the breaking news. Everybody in the media... MSNBC, Fox, CNN, CBS, ABC, all of them are treating this like a catastrophe that is over except for the cleanup. I have news. It is not over. In fact, it may not even have begun. I have reports tonight from very credible inside sources. When I say inside, I mean really inside, inside BP, Mm -hmm. inside the U.S. government, that Surface ships using GPS and depth finders have recorded in the last month the emergence of a bubble under the Gulf of Mexico floor, something between 15 and 20 miles across. This is serious. And tens of feet high. Now, this is preliminary because that measurement, as you know, GPS is degraded for civilian use. So we don't have access to the highest possible resolution of GPS data from the military side, or if, if it exists, they're not telling us. But this, this creation of a bubble around the wellhead, the Deepwater Horizons, you know, BOP sitting on the ocean floor. Is this a gas bubble? This would be a gas bubble. Now, let me, let me go through the physics of what's going on. They started early this year drilling this well. Several geologists, one in particular who became president of one of the companies that basically runs around the world and puts out well catastrophes. Okay. In fact, this individual who you should have on the show, and I have made preliminary uh, steps in moving in that direction, and he has agreed under certain conditions to be a guest. This is the guy who was in charge of putting out all the well fires in Kuwait. Remember how they were saying it would take 10 years? He's like a Red Adair, right? He's he's better than Red Adair. So he's got a proven track record. Anyway, he was writing documents and reports scathingly critical of the idea of doing exactly the kind of deep water drilling the BP did because there are no safety precautions at those depths, not just the depth of the drilling. I mean, everybody's making a big deal of the, the mile underwater, right? Right. That's not the real problem. The water is the problem because if something bad goes really, really wrong, then the water will take it everywhere in the world if you can't turn it off. It's like, remember Fantasia? Yeah. Where where, where where Mickey Mouse couldn't stop the bubble It just kept coming more and more. It goes more and more and more. Well, this guy, this geologist, um, whose name I won't use at the moment, but I will privately tell you who and how to get hold of him and all that, he wrote documents years ago, a couple of years ago, saying that what they were planning to do was nuts because the formations, which is the technical term for the geology under the Gulf, probably could not safely withstand the pressures from opening up a deep, deep well. They went down 22,500 feet for this well. That's miles. Unbelievable. At those depths, the pressures are, get this, write this down, Something like on the order of a hundred thousand pounds per square inch. Jeez, it's four and a half miles deep. You exactly. You cannot contain with current engineering pressures of a hundred thousand pounds psi. Just can't. So this was an accident almost set up to inevitably happen. Then we look at what they did, and they did everything wrong at every decision point. As the documents are coming out, as Congress is making more and more of this stuff available through the hearing process, which has been going on over the last week, we find that BP did everything wrong, as did Transocean, when they were overruled and exceeded to being overruled by a BP guy on site who said, oh, we're going to take out the drilling mud and put in seawater, and oh, we're not going to put in spacers to keep the well centered, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's like the perfect storm, George, of catastrophes of catastrophe could in fact happen, because as the well blew, What happens is you have mud and oil and gas 
a lot of gas, rushing up at the speed of sound up that four-mile pipe. That pipe can't stand it. What happened is the casing literally was blown away. The cement was was shook loose. Was was was, was, was basically blown out of out of the way, and you've got a straight line to the top for gas under almost a hundred thousand psi. Oh my! God. It could blow what, up, couldn't it? What that does is it causes what's called cavitation, which is supersonic bubbles, which ship propellers run into all the time. That's why you have to replace propellers, because as the props spin in the water, particularly on big ships, Navy ships, whatever, right? it, it basically is a supersonic implosion that basically gouges out little craters in even vanadium steel. Could you also not sink if you go right over a bubble like that? Well, exactly. You would if, if, if a bubble came up, which is what I'm going to get to, you would sink every rig and every ship in the, in the region for miles around this wellhead. Which was a possibility for the Bermuda Triangle when Precisely. they talked about ships. Yeah. Exactly. There are occasions where we think ships have have encountered uh, hydrates that, that uh, went to gas. And they just disappear. And they, because the, the water no longer has the, the same buoyancy, and so the ship founders and sinks. Yeah. And everybody dies because you can't swim in that either. You, you just go down instantly. You go down and you die. And so we're looking at potentially thousands of people on all those ships and those rigs that are now trying to solve this by drilling two wells, which, by the way, is also exactly the wrong thing to do. Here's the worst-case scenario. As that... As that well, you know, gushing up at that enormous pressure reached the top, all the way up through we don't know how many layers of geology through four and a half miles, it could be as many as 50 or 60 different layers of limestone, sand lenses, Mm -hmm. gas pockets, oil pockets, different oil reservoirs, which they went down through on the way down. All pouring into this. All being pressurized by this 100,000 PSI infinite fountain at the base, at the bottom of this reservoir. This is like turning on the bubble machine. You know, think Lawrence Welk and having no way to turn it off. That's why, by the way, they have not capped the well. And i got to tell you, if you believe in the abiotic oil theory, like I do, it may never run out. Well, there is a guy, another guy I want you to have on as a guest. His name is Chris Landau, L-A-N-D-A-U. He has delivered two peer-reviewed papers in the last year, one in 2008, one in 2009, on how abiotic oil could be processed and produced right now in this well-stacked series of formations, and no one is telling us whether they're looking at new oil or old oil, and there's a way to tell. So I need to get you that contact info so you can have him on because he's a heavy hitter, and he was, again, one of the few ahead of the pack predicting things like this could happen before they occurred. Well, let me go back to the worst-case scenario. If this well, as it's pressurizing these upper-level strata, were to create cracks in the ocean floor at the top level, which appears to be happening if we listen to Senator Nelson. That's right. That's and right. we listen to the NOAA guys on the underwater plume. Little fissures out there. Fissures, yes. And they tried to cap this well, or the final rupture occurs, you could have the most horrendous gas explosion 50 miles off Louisiana mm-hmm. that you can imagine. Think Mount St. Helens underwater. Underwater. What that would do is create a cloud of incredible toxic material which would then drift with the winds over the shore where there are millions of people. What about a tsunami? The next step is you would get a tsunami moving at between 400 to 600 miles an hour all across in an expanding ring out from where this event occurred and the most vulnerable state for that to occur, because nothing is more than six inches high, is Florida. It isn't Louisiana. It isn't Mississippi or Alabama. It's Florida. 